Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to this subsurface meetup of the subsurface community. Uh, my name is Alex Merced. I'm part of the tech advocacy team uh, here at Dremio as a developer advocate, also with the people who run uh, this, uh, organize a lot of these subsurface community uh, events. Um, and basically today, for this, this, this meetup, what we're going to be doing is talking about a comparison of Iceberg, Patchy Hoodie, and Delta Lake. Um, many of you might be familiar with many of the articles I've written uh, recently um, about comparing these three formats. Basically, my life this year has just been uh, eating, breathing uh, table formats. Um, so it's a really exciting topic, and it's a really exciting time in this space uh, because once you adopt a table format, the possibilities of what you can do in your day lake grow exponentially, uh, which have all sorts of really exciting things going on. Um, and I'll be putting out a lot more work uh, on this subject. So uh, to be aware of that, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn um, or on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is AM Data Lake House, AM Data Lake House, where I'll post like data engineering type stuff. But basically today's agenda, what we're we'll talking about is what's a table format? Like, Alex, you seem really excited about this whole table format thing, but what is it? And why do we need a new one? Because I thought there was something called hive tables that we were using before. So why don't we, why, why are we gonna stop using that if that's a standard? Um, what are these main three table formats? What are these three formats that are, are, are looking to sort of unseat sort of hive as the industry standard? And take a look at like some of the features that, that are available within the three. Like um, this will kind of be a sort of like a high level overview of many of the features that all three of these have. Um, all of them have sort of like their own sort of like unique granular nuances and twists. Um, that uh, they bring to the table. But first off, again, what is a table format? So the idea here is this, like when I use a database on the OLTP side, or I use a data warehouse on the OLAP side um, in my analytical systems, like I take this whole idea of a table for granted. You know, I just put some data in my Postgres database and I can access that table. Uh, it just works. And I put it in, you know, X data warehouse and it's in a table, it just kind of works. But what I don't see is under the hood is that in that box is that they have to come up with a way to say, okay, we're gonna organize this data across a lot of files and we need a way to organize those files so that way the software can recognize that data as a table. So now when we get to the data lake, which, you know, oftentimes our data lake is just several files uh, loaded up onto object storage on places like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, well, if I have these thousand parquet files that really represent one data set, I would like to be able to interact with that data in the same way I can interact with that data in my database or data warehouse as a table. So there's gotta be some mechanism to be able to allow a processing engine or your query engine to recognize that data as a table. And that is what the table format does. So this problem was originally solved by Hive. Okay, so Hive, um, kind of going back to sort of like the old days of Hive, Basically, you had this problem where people were using Hadoop on their data lakes, and they would have to write MapReduce jobs, uh, for those who may remember those. Um, and they, that was not the most pleasant experience. So what Hive did is said, hey, how about you write SQL instead? And then Hive will translate that SQL into a MapReduce job. Um, but to do that, you'd need to have this abstraction of a table. We need to be able to recognize what is table A, what is table B, what is table one. So the, the mechanism that Hive used to say, hey, this is a table was using a directory saying, okay, this directory is the table. So table one is all the files inside the directory table one. Okay, there might be subfolders for different partitions in there, but it's all very folder based. Okay, I know what the partitions are because of the folders. I know what the table is because of the folder and whatever's in that folder is the table, which pretty straightforward, that works. And it, it it worked, you know, basically we were able to write SQL statements. Those SQL statements were able to be converted into MapReduce jobs. Hive did the thing, okay? And this worked very well. It's still heavily used uh, as Hive tables and Hive metastores. Um, and so because of that, it's pretty much the industry standard and works with pretty much every tool in the space, okay? Um, that's one of the pros of, of using like Hive tables. Um, again, with Hive, you were able to take advantage of things like partitioning, which allowed you to speed up your queries because you can, instead of querying, having to scan all the files, just scan a particular partition that applies to your particular query. Um, it was file format agnostic. Whatever files you had in those directories, that was a table. Okay, if they were across different formats or you, know, you had different formats you wanted to work with, that was fine. Um, you could atomically update a whole partition. 
So if I wanted to update a particular partition, um, I could do that. When you start wanting to get more granular changes, things get a little bit more complicated. Or if you want to change multiple partitions, things get a little bit more complicated. But more than anything, what it did is that it created a single central, uh, single central answer to what is the table. Okay, it's no longer do you have this world where we have the data files, but different teams, you know, accidentally create different subsets of the files of the table, and no one's working with the same sort of uniform data set. There's a table; it's defined. We have a place where we can get that definition, the Hive Metastore. And that allowed us to work with sort of the data consistently across, you know, workloads, across teams, and so forth. And so that's why it's important to be able to define what's a table in our data lake more than anything else. It's like it allows us to have that consistency of what is the data set. Now, there were some uh, problems that made this kind of hard to use. Smaller updates are very inefficient. Because generally, mechanically, what's happening in Hive is that when you make an update, it's going to update that entire partition. So if I want to change one record in a partition, I'm going to end up updating that entire partition just to update one record. OK, so that could be really inefficient, really costly in the time to process that query. Um, so it would be nice if we had something that could do that in a smarter way. Um, it was really unsafe to be able to make changes to multiple partitions at the same time. In practice, multiple jobs, so if you have multiple writers trying to write to this data set at the same time, it would be kind of hard to do that safely. Um, basically, everything is based on files and folders. So then what happens is like when you're planning your queries, you're iterating through all these files, which really expands the amount of time you're spending on uh, the you're spending on the scan, uh, just or on the actual query plan before you even get to the scan. So that ended up making the, these queries take a really, really long time. Okay. And because of the way the partitioning work, data consumers would oftentimes end up with full table scans. So let's, let's talk about this one for a moment. So what would happen is that like, I would have some data um, and I want that data to be split up by let's say month. Reason being is that that way, if I query a specific month, ideally the query engine should be able to say, okay, let me only look at that, that month of data. We should speed up my query because I'm not looking at all of the data. So when I create the table, to do that, what I'd have to do is create a new column. I'd have to sit there and say, hey, I have a timestamp. I have a timestamp for every sale, but I want to specifically track the month. So I have to create this like month field and then tell Hive to partition based on that new field. But what would happen is when a data consumer queries the table, if they're not aware of this extra month field and they don't include that in their filters for their queries, they're going to end up with a full table scan. So you end up with a lot of accidental really expensive scans because basically everyone who wants to use a table really needs to understand its engineering. Um, so it would be nice to have a format where we can kind of avoid that. Okay, so these are all potential problems that these newer table formats can solve. And then another issue is like this table statistics were oftentimes um, very stale because what you have to do is you'd have to write these like analyze queries periodically and then they would take a long time because you have to analyze every file on the table to get back these stats instead of incrementally tracking the stats. And that's, again, these are the kind of problems that modern formats are going to provide. So how do we resolve this issue? You adopt a modern table format, which could be Apache Iceberg, which could be Apache Hoodie, which could be Delta Lake. Okay, so these three uh, oh, formats are all open source. They are all, um, they all fix many of these problems that we just listed. Okay, and basically, essentially what they do is they create this metadata layer that allows processing engines that wanna access your table to be able to access your table more efficiently, to be able to recognize which data files are part of the table quicker, which ones do I actually need quicker? Um, so that way they're not spending so much time iterating, opening files, closing files, just to plan the query. So they make really running operations on your data lake practical, and if not advantageous, um, versus you know the previous status quo. Okay, so first we'll let's, let's take a look at each table format and kind of go over their architecture, like how were they built, sort of like what is the thought process, because each one kind of does have sort of a different approach to solving the problem, and the different approaches are going to mean they're going to have different strengths in different use cases and different weaknesses in others. Um, you know, again, there's never one perfect tool that solves all problems all the time, so. Um, Yes. 
So first we have Apache Iceberg. Okay, now what Apache Iceberg does is that it basically looks at your table um, in, a, in a tree of metadata. And basically what it does is that you first you have a piece called the catalog. And the catalog, I think of it like a phone book. So when I wanna know what Bob's phone number is, I go look, well, maybe not nowadays. I'll, I'll go, you know, look at my Google the phone, you know, technology today. But once upon a time, I would look at the phone book, okay? And that's essentially what the catalog is doing. Hey, I wanna know where this table exists, okay? Your processing engine, which could be like a Dremio or a Spark or a Flink, it would then go to this catalog and say, okay, where is this table? And that catalog will then point it to a metadata file. And the metadata file is essentially a table wide picture. So essentially saying the description of the table as a whole. Okay, so saying, okay, this is the current scheme of the table. This is the current partition of the table, so forth, so forth, so forth. So you have sort of this global metadata layer. But then every time you change the table, you're creating a snapshot, okay? And every format has a way of doing snapshot isolation of being able to isolate every time the table changed. So when we identify it, the current snapshot, the, the current snapshot takes us to the next level of metadata called the manifest list. And that basically is that all the details about the particular snapshot, okay? And then this snapshot, basically what it does, it lists a bunch of these manifest files. So the manifest list is a list of manifests. And the reason why we do that is because those manifest files track groups of files and generally by partition. So basically at the manifest less level, level, the query engine can start limiting groups of files saying, okay, we don't need this group. We don't need this group. We don't need this group because they're not inside the partition we need for this query. Once it's narrowed down those big chunks of files, then it'll go to the manifest file, which are those individual groups of files and then be able to look at the stats for each individual file and determine whether it needs it or not. And then after the query engine has gone through those three layers to plan the query, at that point, it's identified the narrowest number of files you need to do the query and goes from there. So basically the approach is, and again, they're all basically this whole idea of trying to narrow down the files is gonna be the same mantra with all three formats. Um, but, um, Basically, what that it does it through these three layers. So by having these three metadata layers, one you can reuse, like these manifest files can be reused across multiple snapshots. There's a lot of reusability, um, and then you have the data files. Okay, so again, you have the metadata files which define the table. You get the manifest list which define the snapshot, and then the manifest which define different groups of files um, that make up the table. And basically, using these files, a query engine can then uh, efficiently use that data to kind of plan that query as efficiently as possible. Okay. Next is Apache Hoodie. So Apache Hoodie takes a timeline approach. So essentially every time you update or make any kind of change to the table, that, that change gets added to a timeline. And basically it's gonna use this sort of timeline of when everything happened to kind of make sure that everything sort of uh, uh, coincides. Okay, and then generally each transaction will have some sort of like different um, label, like it could be labeled a commit or labeled a replace or a cleaning. Um, so that way not only does it know what type of transactions or when do they happen, but what type of transactions they are. And then it will logically figure out how to like reconcile all of that. Okay. Um, the underlying, like the way it'll hold the files is still very a directory based structure. It's just these log files that are essentially the timeline that track the changes and allow the, the query engine to then plan the query from that. Um, now, again, in Iceberg, we limited down the files. In Hoodie, you can do that as well. The way it does that is that it has this op, well, you, optional metadata table. And the metadata table, if you enable it, now it's enabled by default. So once upon a time, it, wasn't, it was enabled off by default, now it's on by default. But what the metadata table does is that it tracks metadata for each um, file that's in your table that can then be used by engines to then prune further. So generally, again, every, every format's gonna have an approach to solving this problem, how to give the engine the data to continue eliminating files to get the most efficient query possible. Okay, so again, Hoodie takes this timeline approach. And then Delta Lake, Delta Lake basically uh, uses two types of files, Delta logs. So each Delta log is essentially a change. So in the same way, like, could you have that timeline and then you had a bunch of timestamp the timeline? These, these delta files kind of work in the same way. 
Um, so basically you make a change to the table, a delta log gets created. Make another change to the table, a delta log gets created. And then what happens is that basically by using those delta logs, it can then recreate the table at any particular point in time. Okay, and, this, and, and basically in the same way that Hoodie can use a timeline to reconstruct the table at different points in time, or that uh, Iceberg could use those snapshots to recreate the table at different points in time. Um, but with Delta Lake, what happens is that eventually what you may wanna do is group some of those Delta logs into a checkpoint file. And this just allows it to more efficiently uh, so that way you don't have to have so many of these uh, Delta log files. You create checkpoints that summarize those changes. Okay, and then in each of these files, um, there are indexes of columns. Okay. So basically uh, it maintains like an index of, I think by default it's like the first 32 columns um, that then can be used to prune files. So basically using those indexes on those files, it can identify, okay, this file has this, this file has that. For this query, we don't need this file. For this query, we don't need this file. In the same way that Hoodie used the metadata table, in the same way Iceberg used the, the metadata from the manifest and the manifest list. To, to reduce the files it was scanning. So again, just just different approaches to solving the same problem, which is basically figuring out one, allowing the processing engine to identify what is the table, and two, how can we narrow down the amount of files we need to scan? Because that's really how you're gonna speed yourself, your queries up. The less files you have to scan, the faster your, your query is gonna be. Um, and then the second thing that be, you know, a faster processing engine. So take a look at like features, okay? Um, on as all, all three table formats offer asset transactions, okay? So basically, as far as being able to do like safe updates, safe deletes, safe um, creates, basically be able to update the table, table safely, you can do that with all three. They all have different mechanisms for doing that. Okay, um, partition evolution. This is a feature that's unique to Iceberg. So what is this feature? Uh, what partition evolution does is that let's say I'm partitioning the table by like month. So now it's breaking up the data by month as I add data to it. And now eventually I want to shift to organizing it by day. And I want to partition it by day. Pretty much in the status quo hive and in the other table formats, what would happen is that you would have to rewrite the table. Okay, I do think there's upcoming uh, features to help incremental partition changes, but um, Right now, like Iceberg, has, basically what you do is you, you just actually just change it because it's a metadata transaction. Everything in Iceberg is metadata focused. So essentially what happens is that going forward, you would just partition the data by the new partition scheme and you don't have to rewrite all the old data. So then you don't have to have this expensive table rewrite because you change the way you want to partition. So currently uh, exclusively an Iceberg feature. Uh, schema evolution, Iceberg has full schema evolution. Um, so you can update, delete, uh, reorder, um, add columns, rename columns, and you can do it with multiple engines. Uh, Hoodie has all of those as well. Um, right now, only, I think you can only do them from Spark. And then Delta Lake has all of them, we'll have a different slide with this, but has all of them except drop a column, which is going to be added in Delta Lake 2.0. And then, which you can't test out now because they just released the release candidate yesterday um, with all the other announcements. So, um, so you're starting to see more parity there um, as, as these updates go. Uh, time travel, they all have the ability to time travel. So again, in Iceberg, you can time travel to any previous snapshot. In Hoodie, you can time travel to any commit on that timeline. In Delta Lake, you can time travel to any Delta log um, that has, a, and in all three, if you do cleanup operations, like you expire old snapshots, um, and do different types of cleanup operations, you may not be able to go all the way back in time past the point where you did your cleanup. Um, so always keep that in mind when you're thinking about like, how far do I want to expire my snapshots? Um, basically, far as the actual file formats that your date, your table can be consist of um, with Iceberg, oop, I hit the button there. So let me just go back a slide. Dude, dude. Oh, did it again. But point is like with Apache Iceberg, you can do a Parquet, Avro, or a C, as far as what files can make up your table. In Hoodie, it's Parquet or ORC. And then for Delta Lake, it's only Parquet. Now, again, back to the uh, schema evolution. So you can see like this table. So if you if basically, for those who've read some of my articles on this topic, I do try to go back and update them as there's updates to each of these formats. 
So, you know, basically from the original version of the article, this has changed quite a bit um, because all formats are constantly updating. Like all of these are still like in, they're all mature, um, but they're still adding a lot of new features. And they still have a really robust uh, roadmaps. So you're trying to see like a little bit more uh, parity here um, far as, uh, as a scheme evolution, but you can see like iceberg you have, you've had all the um, uh, different types of ways to update a table. So add column, drop column, rename column, update column, reorder columns. In hoodie, um, they added the remaining ones in the, I think was it point 13 uh, version, which is the recent, most recently updated one. So now they have that, but it's currently only supported in Spark. Delta Lake has them all. Um, and the drop column is going to be added in the, the upcoming release of 2.0. So not there officially yet. Um, so you're starting to see again, a little bit more parity there than there was. Now let's talk about partitioning. Cause again, partitioning is a big deal because it's one of the biggest techniques you use to speed up your tables. Okay. So what can I do when it comes to partitioning with all three of these? Can I change the partitioning scheme without having to rewrite the table? In Iceberg, I can. I can just change and say, hey, I want, to I, want to, um, I want to partition by month now. I want to partition by day now. I want to partition by hour. OK, I would like to add a bucketing partition or a partition based on a truncated value. These are all things that I can do. Um, Apache Hoodie and Delta Lake, right now, you can't do that. So if you want to change partitioning, that would result in a uh, table rewrite. Uh, basically, generally, the, the way they try to compensate for that right now is in their data skipping features. So being able to use like that metadata, that metadata table to narrow down at the file level or using uh, the Delta Lake indexes at the file level, they, tr at the file, um, they try to kind of compensate for it there currently. Um, but again, there's always like more releases coming down the road. So we'll see where that is going forward. Can you use transforms on existing columns to specify partitions? So what I'm talking about here is like, how do we, when I specify my partition, I say, hey, I want to partition by this field. Do I get this extra layer of being able to say, hey, I want to transform by day without having to create a whole separate field? Okay, in Iceberg, Iceberg has a set of transforms built into Iceberg um, that allow me to say, hey, I want, to, I want to partition based on this timestamp field, but you know, I want to do it based on hour. Or let's say I'm doing like a first name. And let's say I have millions and millions of names that that would be a very, that'd be like the cardinality would not be conducive to being a partition field, right? Because there's just too many names. So that wouldn't really be a good partition field. They have something like a truncate perform where I can say, hey, only partition based on the first letter without having to create a new field. So they have these nice ergonomic transforms. Uh, hoodie, you just part, currently just partition based on the actual column. In Delta Lake, what you can do is that there's a feature called generated columns. So you're not necessarily doing the transform on the partition instructions, but what you can do is you can generate a column. So you're still making a, a separate column, but the field is automatically filled in um, based, on a, based on a Spark formula. So basically it's, it's kind of set, you can only use um, the, any, any function that's supported in Spark, which there's a lot of functions in Spark. Um, the question is, would that work inside other engines uh, that don't have those, those functions? But you can basically create these generated columns that in all sorts of different ways. And then you can partition based on that generated column. And you kind of end up getting the same effect because what happens, um, which actually this goes into the next bullet, consumers don't need to understand the tables partitioning benefit from. So with Iceberg, um, what happens is because you specify that transform, if I, if I query the table just on the timestamp column, I don't have to worry about a separate hour or day column it'll know just based on me querying that column that I partitioned it based on hour or day and take advantage of those, that partitioning scheme. Okay. Um, in Hoodie, you need to query the, the, the column that you partitioned on directly. Um, there is like some, some formulas you can specify in the query at, this, at the time to do like some transforms. Um, but again, if you were just casually like querying, you would have to kind of know to do that engineering. And then with Delta Lake, because you're using the generated columns feature, it'll automatically generate the predicate. So you still technically need to query that extra hour field, let's say, but you don't actually have to manually write that out. It'll detect that, hey, you are querying this other column. You're filtering by this other column where there is a generated uh, field on, and it'll then add the predicate. So they take advantage of So with Iceberg and Delta Lake, 
you can kind of have those sort of like granular partitions and then it wouldn't be too hard to take advantage of them from the consumer. Like they don't have to get too deep into the engineering. Okay, file pruning. So again, partitioning is one layer of how you can speed up the table. There are other ways you can speed up the table uh, with how you sort the table, um, with how you, with the ability for that table to like uh, do data skipping uh, or file pruning. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. So an iceberg at that, you know, that manifest level, that's where it tracks the individual files it tracks like the minimum, like the range of values for each field in that table. So using that, the processing engine can do min max filtering and say, okay, well, you let's say I'm scanning for everybody above the age of 20, but this particular file doesn't have anyone above the age of 20, so we don't need that file. Okay, so even if, if, if partitioning didn't filter that file out, the min max filtering can filter that file out. Apache Hoodie, again, can do the same thing using its column stats index inside that metadata table, okay? So essentially, um, it can do that. And then what it does is that you can specify transforms in your query. So when you do the actual filter, um, you're specifying a transaction there and uh, a transform in the query. And then it uses data skipping to filter out those files. So that's why, you know, it's not the, quite the same thing as this, but there is sort of a mechanism, but it's using this data skipping feature where it's skipping the granular files versus skipping a partition of files. Um, so, and again, more efficient to be able to get rid of like a clump of files versus like each individual file, but they all do a little bit of both. And then Delta Lake maintains indexes on the first so many columns. So this is like, you can, this is something you can like change in Delta Lake. So you can say, hey, I wanna only index the first 10 columns and the first 30 columns. I'm pretty sure that by default, it's the first 32 columns. And what it'll do is that based on the indexes on those 32 columns, it'll use any filters on those 32 columns to, to then uh, narrow down the files. So we'll say, okay, well, this file only has, only covers this level of data. So we don't need that for this query. So we'll filter that out. So at the end of the day, they both can take advantage of partitioning and file pruning. They just have different mechanisms, slightly different mechanisms for doing it. Um, and, and there's also, again, different ergonomics of doing it. Cool, query engine support. So at the end of the day, like you go through all this trouble of adopting this nice data lake table format. And then what happens, your favorite tool doesn't, you can't read the, you can't read the data with your favorite tool or you can't write to it with your favorite tool. So at the end of the day, what really matters is like, can your favorite tools use the thing? Okay, so when it comes to reading data, okay, um, here you can see a list of all, uh, or of many different uh, tools for reading data, okay, any different query engines, and you can see who supports what. So um, to kind of get to the, the, the point, oh, let me go back. Okay, but to kind of get to the point here, Iceberg is supported by 11 out of the 15 tools, okay? Apache, uh, Hoodie is supported by 10 out of the 15 tools, okay? And Delta Lake is supported by 12 of the 15 tools, okay? Um, that's for reading, okay? And then again, uh, keep in mind that Delta Lake is very like um, built into sort of the Databricks fabric. So that, so they have so they have the additional support with like Databricks SQL Analytics, Databricks Spark, things like that. Um, but then we take a look at like Iceberg and Hoodie, they got some like unique support with like, um, like well, when it comes to like Redshift or like Apache Drill, like Iceberg is the only one that's supported by Apache Drill. So there's some unique things here. Um, this chart is inside the original table format uh, comparison article. So I would refer, refer to that to see like the breakdown, the, like the granularity here, but they all generally have pretty robust read support um, across formats. Okay. And then write support, even more important because oftentimes like, hey, we're worrying about like, ingesting data can i update this data make sure that you know all the newest data is there okay um and then when we take a look here okay as far as write support goes okay eight out of nine tools have write support for iceberg four out of nine the nine tools listed have write support for hoodie and four my mouse is saying to do clicks okay and then four out of nine uh, of, well, five out of the nine have support for Delta Lake, okay? Now, 
again, what matters is what tools do you use? Okay, so like you take a look here and you say, okay, hey, which are the tools that I use? And does, the, does this particular table format use it, it work with the tools that I particularly use? Okay, but they do have different levels of support. Okay, and there are like nuances as um, far as like, for example, one nuance to point out, like if you're using Databricks Spark with Iceberg, it works, but you might run into some issues with like a merge into statement because uh, the Databricks Spark uh, kind of reserves like the merge statement specifically for Delta Lake and things like that. So um, there are little nuances again, whenever you use any tool with any particular format. Okay, project and community governance. Okay, so the story here is this. These are all open source projects. And an important thing is that you want there to be an active community, one for support, because you need, you know, all, all three formats, like I'm in the Slack community for all three of these, and they're all very active. Um, you know, and that's always a great place to go, go get like answers and ask people and, and uh, you know, commune on, on troubleshooting. But you also care about the activity and the actual development on the project, like, and how transparent that activity is. Um, so here we're just gonna kind of go over that. Oh, go back there. I lost this little trigger happy today. Okay. But bottom line is we take a look at this at a high level. Okay. We take a look at Iceberg and Hoodie, they're both Apache projects. Okay, while Delta Lake is a Linux project. And the main reason why that's a, like that's a that's a tangible difference is just that Apache and Linux and Linux that they have different standards as far as like, okay, what are the things they expect? Uh, far as um, a project being part of their portfolio, so like with an Apache project, you know, basically the the PMC, uh, the committer, the base of the committer committees, uh, they're they're basically visible right there on the Apache website. You can kind of see a lot of that. You get a lot of transparency and things like that. Well, Linux more focuses on providing support to open source projects. Has a uh, requires like a little bit less on sort of like inf uh, of that immediate transparency right away. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean the project itself doesn't do those things. It just means like it's just not required to as to be a Linux Foundation project, okay? And it, all the stats as I go through this section, just to kind of you know be clear on what we're going over here, these are all based on on information that's publicly available through the core GitHub repo of each of these projects. So we're not fact we're basically we're not looking at all these projects generally have multiple repos uh, for different features. There's forks that other people create to work off to work on the side, uh, people who do work in private repos, that stuff is not necessarily captured here, uh, especially like the private repos because you can't capture a lot of that because it's private, um, but this gives you a picture of sort of what is the transparently available activity on that project. Um, and again, uh, so basically here, and these are numbers of, of, this is back from March when the article was first published. So you can see like the difference in the number of contributors. Okay, and again, this is based on the core repo public contributions. Okay, so this doesn't count any like private contributions or contributions that have occurred outside of the open source repos that might have gotten merged into these re repositories. Okay, but you can see they're all pretty active. Um, again, there's a little bit of an outlier here. You see like Delta Lake has a little bit less activity in its open source repo. Um, they did make the announcement that they're kind of open sourcing everything yesterday. Um, so, uh, Basically, the expectation would be that we'll start seeing a little bit more parity in these numbers uh, over time, um, but that'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and then here's, again, based on those, those, that open source repo, based on what we can transparently see on, the, on GitHub, okay, when we break down uh, the different companies that have contributed to these code bases, we can kind of see like Iceberg and Hoodie have very diverse a number of numbers of companies that have contributed to the code base on Iceberg. So it's, no, it's not like one really sort of dominant company that really controls the project. I mean, when you see it, it makes sense. Netflix is the biggest contributor to um, Iceberg because that's where Iceberg was initially created. Uber was the biggest contributor over to, to Hoodie because that was where Hoodie was originally created. So that, that makes sense, but you can still see that it's fairly split up. So you, you have support for a lot of companies and they're all making fairly substantial uh, contributions to these projects, which is actually part of the part of the kind of requirements they have for being an Apache project. Like uh, Apache does really kind of really highly value sort of like this committer diversity and and, and whatnot. Um, well, on Delta Lake, again, far as what we can see on the public Git repo, uh, it's mostly uh, data data. Basically, all the contributions are, and this means pull requests, issues, commits. 
are from uh, employees of Databricks. Again, does that necessarily mean uh, there's anything wrong with the product itself? No, not at all. But again, it, it does paint a picture of who, who basically has the biggest influence on the direction of the project. Um, again, yesterday there was the announcement that it's now going to be open source. So the expectation would be that we're going to see a little bit more diversity in the circle uh, based on that public GitHub repo. Um, there was a, uh, I saw a number in an article of 6,400 contributors. Um, so I'm assuming that the difference must be from private activity that's not shown in the public repo. Um, but um, again, there are sort of like changes that have occurred in the last 24 hours uh, that would lead us to expect that we're going to start seeing some some more uh, convergence of some of this going forward. Uh, cool, 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 cool. Okay, at the end of the day, like what is the right format for you? Okay, because at the end of the day, again, it's not one size fits all, um, but there's some questions you can ask yourself as you're going out there doing your, your proof of concepts and, and trying these things out. Okay. What tools do I use today? Because again, you want to make sure you have you use the thing that supports your write and read tools. And will this let me do that? Okay. Do I think I may change tools? Are there any tools that I know that are, you know, coming down the, the pipeline? Do they support any these formats? Do I plan on using those future tools? Do I plan on changing the tools that I use in the future? Okay. How important is that sort of broad compatibility for my particular workload? Okay. Um, like, for example, if you do everything for the most part in Spark, um, then it may not matter so much as far as like all your ingestion. Um, but if you use different tools, then it becomes like a, some, a little bit heavier consideration. Okay. How often will my schema evolve? Because evolve? again, there's going to be differences in like how each, what tools each one has when it comes to evolving your table. Now, there's a little bit more parity now when it comes to schema evolution. Um, but Again, right now, still Iceberg is the only one that allows you to evolve your partition. So again, the question is like, how often do you find yourself changing your partition scheme? This is something that really like is of value to my particular workflow. Okay. Does the format enable an intuitive and easy to use SQL syntax? So all three formats have their own SQL extensions that you can use in Spark and in other places. Um, the syntax can be a little bit quite different uh, between the three. So another thing you want to do when you're testing out the different formats is actually just trying out like the different SQL statements and asking yourself like, are these things that are intuitive for my team and intuitive for my consumers for them to take advantage of these formats when they query these tables? Um, and especially particularly with the partitioning, it's like, is the partitioning easy to use so that way we can avoid those unnecessary table scans? Okay, so that we can get full value of all the optimizations, not just the, da not just the data skipping and the file pruning, but we also really want to take full advantage of that partitioning. How can we do that? Okay, is there a large and diverse developer community? So again, keeping an eye on sort of like how many people are contributing, how many people can I see? Can I see who's in charge? Like so, in that case, like who's part of that? That that uh, in the case of Databricks, the technical steering committee. In the case of Apache Hoodie and Apache Iceberg, who is on that PMC? Okay, who are on those committees? Okay. Um, and then the reason being is that because you want to make sure that that support for that tool is going to continue to grow and it's going to continue to exist. So those communities are there as a resource. So you want strong, robust communities. Okay. And of course, you also want to make sure that like the influence of that tool. So that essentially that tool's roadmap is something that kind of is more broadly accessible. Um, so that way all your tools can benefit from it. Um, all, all your workflows can benefit from it. Uh, and so forth. So these are the things that kind of just ask yourself as you evaluate these tools. And with that, again, just to kind of remind you, like I'll be publishing, so far we've had three articles on table format comparison. So I've done the original table format comparison article. There's one that goes a little bit more into the governance. So that goes a little bit more deeper into like that whole, what's the difference between Apache and Linux foundation. And then there's the one that came out last week, which is on partitioning that goes much more in depth on each individual formats partitioning features. There's more uh, articles coming up. Um, so basically, I think in the, in, in the next couple of months, expect there to be one on schema evolution and just kind of showing how the differences in those features between the formats are, uh, performance. So I'll be trying to do some performance checks. I recently created a Docker image that should make it pretty easy to uh, try out all three, just if you want to just try out the syntax and go play with it in Spark. Uh, if you look in Docker, just look up, a, it's, I think I called it table format playground. Um, you'll find it there. Uh, it, it'll be linked to in a, an upcoming article um, as I come up with some more hands-on articles as well. 
So keep that up. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start taking questions. So let me look over here to see what kind of questions we got in queue. Yeah, you have some great questions, Alex. I love um, those questions. One question that came up was, and I don't remember, this was about the 930 mark. Um, is what you're describing the same what people name modern data warehousing? Um, well, I don't know. I would say like the term modern data warehouse and modern data stack are really sort of more amorphous terms um, in the sense that they could they could apply to different architectures. So to be more specific, what we're talking about today is really data lake house architecture. And this is basically architecture where we're trying to replicate as much, if not and more, of what you can do in a data warehouse in sort of that closed off environment. Because just to kind of illustrate what the problem is, like nothing wrong with a data warehouse, but at the end of the day, I'm creating a, I'm taking a subset, I'm making a copy of a subset of my data that then gets copied into a mark and then analysts then make additional extracts to speed up their BI. Um, you know, you get this whole sort of like data sprawl. It's, it can be kind of expensive. Your data is kind of stuck in there. So it's really hard to migrate to something else in the future. And then if new tools come out with really cool features, your data is kind of locked in there. Um, so how can we avoid that? It's by doing more work on the data lake and giving a data lake more data warehouse like features. And that's what we refer to as a data lake house. And the first step into building a data lake house is adopting a table format. Because it's that table format that's going to enable all the tools to be able to more performantly access the data in your data lake because they're going to have all that metadata and all that, um, that layer that really allows it to sort of optimize its query planning before it actually scans the files. Cool. Great. Um, and then another question we have is, do all three support snapshot retention and compaction? Uh, they all three have something equivalent to that. So basically all three, format, all three formats have a, a method of snapshot isolation. So Iceberg is just their outright snapshots. Uh, in Hoodie, it's through that timeline. So basically, you can track that timeline, and then um, and then all three do have compaction. Like you can you can run compaction operations at all three. For those who don't know what compaction is, is if you have a lot of small files, because you're doing a lot of like really small. Let's say like you're ingesting data every five minutes, and so small amounts of data. Uh, eventually, those small files are going to affect the speed of your query because you're scanning through more files. So what compaction does? It just takes all those files and just turns them into a few. Takes a lot of big fi small files. And turns them into fewer big files. So they all have these operations. They have different features and different ways of doing it. So it is important to actually try them out and like see like what the knobs as far as how you can tweak your compaction jobs, which ones are, are going to be more most uh, conducive to your particular workflow. Uh, as an example, like when you do compaction in Iceberg, you can choose between different strategies that will compact your files differently, which can provide more optimization but take longer, um, or you know just do a quick sort of Let's combine the files kind of thing. So each of them have different options when it comes to that. Um, now, as far as snapshot retention, all of them have snapshot retention. Each of them have like a different mechanism for um, getting rid of some of those snapshots because you, you eventually don't want to keep every snapshot possible, whether it's for like governance reasons where you have certain regulations and you can't keep data beyond a certain date. So you mm -hmm. need to clean up those older snapshots. Um, they all have different ways of doing that. And all of them, it's going to be pretty uniform that once you clean up those old snapshots, you don't have access to them anymore. So that's like the limitation of like the, the time travel feature. Okay, great. You have a ton of questions coming in. So everyone, if we can't get to them, we'll, we'll send out um, a response um, when we send out the recording. But the next one is, are there any other caveats reading writing to Iceberg from Databricks Spark other than merge into? Not that I'm aware of. That's, that's the brain that's, that, that just kind of came on my radar. So right mm -hmm. now I'm actually in the midst of just doing some research on sort of like what, what solutions there are to that currently. Um, so any... uh, that's hmm? okay. And the, yeah. And then was just like, or any other obvious performance differences. It sounds like you're still looking into that. Uh, well, it's more specific, like in the syntax, like far as like the compatibility with Databricks, just because again, and again, just to be clear, there's two versions of Spark. There's the open source version of Spark, which works completely fine with Iceberg. Um, and then there's Databricks, version of Spark that when, you, when you're in that Databricks sort of uh, environment. And the reason being is that it's very, Delta Lake is very integrated into Databricks tools because they're the ones who created Delta Lake. Um, so they reserve that word. So that creates some collisions when you're using that specific version of Spark. Um, now, far as like other kind of little nuances, 
I'm still, again, testing things out and trying out different things across different engines. Um, and then far as like affecting performance, it just, that's going to be more engine specific. Because at the end of the day, like each of these formats, they're just providing the information. They're providing a, a layer of metadata that an engine can use. Two different engines can look at the same iceberg hoodie Delta Lake table and have completely different performance because the sophistication at which they approach that metadata might be different. So mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day, like just because one engine supports multiple formats, you still want to make sure you do your testing um, with, the, with the tools that you like and then make sure that you, you, you try to do apples to apples comparisons. Because right now you're, seeing, you're trying to see more comparisons of like these table formats, but details that are oftentimes lacking in these comparisons are like what, not only just what engines they use, but like what are the settings? Because the settings on the engine can have a huge impact. Um, on the performance, the settings on the table can have a performance because you could run a test on all three formats um, and, and, and manufacture bad performance in one if you set the settings right. You can you know, basically set, put bad settings on one table format and good settings on another. So when you look at different uh, comparisons that are out there, make sure you look for that granular description of exactly how they did it so that way you know they're comparing apples to apples um, because it, it's, you know, uh, this, the numbers game and how people play with numbers. So uh, keep that in mind. The more transparency there is in how the data is, is created, the the more we can kind of look at that data. And it will be trying to create some data going forward as well. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to take one now from the Q&A. Um, does Iceberg have clustering? With Hootie, I don't need um, partition evaluation uh, evolution because I can recluster without a need to adjust um, partitions, the combination of this and Z order Hilbert in my XP, sorry, okay. has resulted in perf advantage for Hootie. Got it. Yeah. So no, um, clustering right now is, um, something that iceberg doesn't have. And what that, all that is, is just like, basically what you're doing is you're doing sort of ongoing compaction. So instead of doing compaction as a separate job, it'll just compact as you periodically bring in data. Um, so you do have compaction with iceberg and you you will have z order on the next release of iceberg um which will be another another method of sorting that's that's pretty efficient um so you will have z order but far as it like creating that sort of continuous compaction you would have to use like a tool like an airflow um or prefect to kind of schedule out those jobs uh, uh asynchronously um and then two in the future dremio's arctic service should be able to handle that so basically that kind of like maintenance type service that, that, that exists with like clustering would be part of sort of the feature set of, of, of a service like Dremio Arctic uh, for iceberg tables. Great. Here's another one. Some data warehouse DBMSs are now ex, um, accessing at lake house structures via external tables. Do you see that as making sense? I'll repeat the question. Some data warehouses, DBMSs, are now mm -hmm. assessing lake houses structure via external tables. Do you see that as making sense? Oh, I mean, well, it works. Like in a sense, you can query the table. The question is like how performantly? Because a lot of these data warehouses, they're focusing on their proprietary formats. They're basically, they're trying to optimize how things work inside the box. Okay, so they're now more so trying to give you access to things outside of the box in a sense, so that the data in your data lake, but it's not necessarily like their priority. So always, there's always an issue of just because can I do it, can I do it performantly? So, you know, if your needs are to read data, don't assume just because you have an external tables feature in a particular data warehouse that'll let you do that at scale. Um, you do want to make sure you, again, test that out first. Um, but a lot of times like the data lake house engines um, that are tailored to these specific formats, okay? Um, you know, so like, for example, Dremio can, can do reads on Delta Lake and Iceberg, uh, you know, Databricks, you can do read Delta Lake. Like the, these tools are more designed specifically for these formats uh, and to, to do that performantly. Um, so when you're taking a look at data warehouses, yes, they may have that feature, but I would do a little deeper investigation before just saying, hey, that's enough. Great. Okay, next one. How do the different formats differ in their concurrency control, especially when it comes to concurrent rights? Um, for the most part, I would say like at the high level, they all employ a method um, called optimistic concurrency control. So they may, the way they may implement that may be a little bit different, but it's still generally the same idea. So the, the, the basic concept of optimistic concurrency control is that generally you're gonna let 
everyone who wants to write writes. Everyone writes assuming that they're going to successfully write. But generally, you use some sort of like locking mechanism or something that denotes who made the change first. So when the first party successfully makes the change, then what happens when the next party is about done? So like let's say writer B gets finished second, they'll realize that oh, there's been a change since since I started writing, so I need to reattempt the write. Um, so they generally all, to some extent, use optimistic concurrency. Um, I do think Hoodie before used a different method um, in certain circumstances, but the details of that one is escaping me. But I do think now for a lot of stuff, they are using optimistic concurrency writing. And, and I'm pretty sure that's how it is in Delta Lake and for sure in Iceberg. So um, I'm, they're using a similar model, but again, the mechanism, because they have different types of metadata and the way their metadata is structured, um, the way they'll execute that may be different. So like an Iceberg, you use a locking mechanism of a catalog. So if your catalog is something like a Hive Metastore or an AWS Glue or a Project Nessie, they all have big different locking mechanisms to make sure that you can safely write uh, the newest update, uh, even though you have multiple writers interacting at the same time. Okay, anyway, next question. You have a lot, Alex, so oh, <laughs> I'm oh, glad good. you left a lot of time. Um, is any of the format, Hootie, um, question mark, better than others for streaming time series IoT data? Um, it depends on your particular use case. So I always say try things out. All of them have streaming features. Um, like I do know like Hoodie was more designed with that particular like use case involved because it was basically built over there at Uber. And you know, you're talking about like a lot of streaming data from from cars everywhere. So it really was really sort of tailored specifically for the streaming use case. Um, but uh, Iceberg has strong features when it comes to streaming and so does Delta Lake. So I would, again, may, run your test first. Never take for granted that whether your particular use case with particular tools you have will um, may not work better in a different configuration. But um, I would definitely say like Iceberg is like more like a more general sort of like, hey, we're this is like for all use cases kind of kind of approach. Uh, Hoodie definitely has a much more like streaming focus uh, uh, roadmap um, and architecture, um, the whole timeline and all that. And then um, Delta Lake also kind of general, but then again, it has a lot of integration with like a lot of Databricks features that provides it some of that some some specialized tools for special use cases. But then again, you're then you're locked into that sort of environment. Um, so then it becomes a question like. No, there's there's just different considerations each way. Okay. Okay. Um, if possible, can you please? I mean, this is more, I guess, post also provide comparison of mentioned three formats against AWS Lake Formation governed tables. So maybe that's something we can include in the post wrap up. Um, yeah. Um, if you can send more details on like, sort of like what kind of, what that comparison would look like. So like what, what, what was specific about like formation you'd, you want details of, and then I can always consider that for like an upcoming article or an upcoming video, um, far as more information. Cause we're going to be trying to put out as, you know, a lot of content, uh, uh around basically adopting a data lake table format, uh, yep. because it is an important piece of moving our data infrastructure to the next era. Awesome. And you guys can email alex.merced at dremio.com or feel free to reply to any of the event emails and we'll make sure to get that to him. Yes. And you can also follow me on Twitter at amdatalakehouse. That's probably going to be, the, or, or, or add me on LinkedIn. Those are going to probably be the quickest ways to, to get in touch with me. Also, if you're in any of the Slack communities for either of the three table formats, I'm in there. So you can message me there as well. Um, so I'm pretty accessible. Awesome. And then, um, this might be similar. Are there any benchmark results for these table formats? I understand that for different workloads, the formats can behave differently, but it'll be nice to see some numbers. Yeah, no, that'll be something um, I, I will be working on on the tech advocacy team very shortly. Um, some of the numbers out there that I've seen so far, again, they just lack a lot of the details on the way they execute it. So you see, you see numbers that tell you completely different things like this format's better, this format's better. Um, but they don't give enough detail for like, again, how they configured the table, how they configured the engine. Are they even using the same engine? Are they using the same size, like, you know, same instant processing instances on AWS far as like, what is that engine using far as like your processing computing power? Um, there's a lot of like sometimes details that are missing to, to really kind of say, Hey, I really think this, this is a good number to look at. Awesome. Um, I know we just have time for a few more, but how can these table formats be integrated with data? automation tools like dbt 
Um, basically, you should be able to schedule them. Like uh, at the end of the day, like they just provide a layer. So oftentimes, you're when you're scheduling the tools, you're going to be interacting with something else. Like you might be interacting with the data through like Dremio or through Spark or through a Flink. So to the extent that tools like like DBT, Airflow, a lot of these kind of like scheduling type tools, um, and uh, and uh, or might might not to the extent that they interact with those other tools, uh, they should work just fine. It shouldn't be, I can't imagine be too much of a difference. Now, specifically for DBT, I wouldn't say I'm, I, I know specifically in that particular use case, but in general, like to the extent that you can schedule these other tools, it should just work. Awesome. Okay. Well, you got a lot of kudos. So <laughs> we're so happy that you guys enjoyed this.